All righty. Okay. So hello. Um, this is, yeah, just a little meeting. This of uh, the closure data science community. We're here to talk about some sort of compatibility between the tools mostly today and also just hear from some other library and tool authors about where the ecosystem is at and, and what kind of problems we're experiencing and what kind of direction to take next, I guess, mostly. So I'm Kira, uh, just a closure developer, sort of a data science noob, but um, interested in, in all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, I don't know if it's useful. I don't know, Daniel, do you want to do a quick, like, short little intros, go around, maybe just say your name and, and what brought you here? So, yeah, I know this is always awkward. I guess sometimes I've done this, how I've seen this work in, in other meetings is like you always, you pick the next person. So, because there's everyone's in a different order on everyone's screen, I think. So, I'll nominate Lukash. Yeah, it's me. Um, yeah, I'm Lucas. Uh, I just accidentally just, uh, fell into the Cyclosh uh, thing. I'm not a data scientist either. And uh, I've just been building a tool that uses some visualization or stuff. And then I realized that there are a lot of other tools I kind of have to be kind of compatible with. Um, and then I looked into all of them and found out that, well, they sh actually share a lot of code. They just don't really share it um and writing one tool that incorporates all of them is kind of hard because you have to do it differently in everyone so i thought we could kind of come together and try to make it easier for everybody and save a lot of work so yeah that's why i'm here and uh, do you want me to uh, also talk about the discussion we had already on Zulip, or or do we first do the introductions um let's go around i guess do a quick intros and then we can pick up that conversation okay cool then um cool. i guess it's daniel's turn oh thank you uh so i'm daniel i'm involved in this node space project one of those literate programming projects in closure and now pavel hello hi everyone um, I'll try to do it this way. Oh, can you see my screen? Yes. It's just the eternal question. Just uh, so, yeah, I'm kind of working on this right now. So this is the project I'm working on, and it's in this kind of tools for thought space, and it's this kind of visual closure, small talky kind of thing. Um, so that's one thing I'm working. Well, that's the main thing I'm working on. Um, helping out to maintain this library, which is the bridge to Wolfram language and um, helping to organize this conference. So, <laughs> so that's me very sort of quickly. Um, thank you. You wanna pick someone to go next? I will, yes. I need to kind of see who's next. Maybe Peter, I think I haven't seen the yeah, edge, Peter. Is it Stromberg or Stromberg? Stromberg, if you can say that. <laughs> say, say it again? Stromberg. Stromberg. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's well, tricky. Uh, but, uh, to say one day, to one day. <laughs> one day. But there's a Bond villain who's called Stromberg. So that's very similar. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm Peter. And... Uh, um, I joined this meeting because of mainly of the name of it and just uh, realized that I was probably very interested to, to listen in on uh, uh, yeah, what's going on in, in, this, in, in this space. Because I'm, I'm the creator of uh, Calva. This is the logo. And... Uh, um, so, I, so I'm super interested in how how Calva can can support the, all these. And Calva is, of course, a, a visual tool as well. But any, uh, anyway, uh, it's more about me curious about how how Calva can can support uh, uh, yeah this space uh, the best. And 
Uh, I'm sorry for uh, for being late, and thank you, Lucas, for sending that <laughs> reminder to me. That was awesome. Uh, so uh, since I was late, I don't know who hasn't. Uh, okay, David, it's you. <laughs> Dave Orm, I'm uh, here kind of 80% uh, lurking. I'm very interested in native user interfaces for Clojure. I have a uh, project that I will be releasing officially and maybe even today, certainly in the coming weeks um, on GitHub that allows you to do SWT user interfaces really easily in uh, Clojure. So that's that. Uh, Mauricio? Okay, uh, my internet started to waver, so I hope everything goes smoothly right now. Uh, okay, like Peter, I'm not a data science guy, and I'm also working on a plugin for VS Code also. We don't compete, but anyway, it's a different like approach. <laughs> um, well, I'm, my tooling is mostly related to evaluating Clojure code, and as a side thought, I began to work on something like that I call the interactive visualizations. So something that you can evaluate closure code and then decide how to render it on the editor. It's a, it's in the very beginning, but it looks promising. I did a presentation about uh, Prolog in Clojure when I used this, this tooling to render a chessboard. So in fact, I did the example rendering the chessboard all the time. So it was like, like kind of dog food. In, I mean, I'm using my own tool to develop things that I feel like they're comfortable. And I am also suffering the same problem of lots of people are doing great visualizations in the closure space, but mine have to be re implemented almost from scratch. So both on Atom, with chlorine and VS with Clover, I meant everything from scratch. So I'm kind of interested to see if I can reuse the tooling of other people and just have a richer set of libraries. And I'm also starting something that I don't know if I will continue. That's uh, trying to revive all the Atom editor with Clojure script. I'm not sure if I will keep doing that. It's simply too much work, but well, we never know. Maybe we can like join forces with this small talk thing that people are talking. Like, use some of the small talk stuff in Clojure and see if we can go somewhere. <laughs> and okay, uh, who Andres, you already presented? Oh, we cannot hear somehow, Andres. Uh, we'll try try like this. Hi, I'm Andres. I work for a small company doing analytics, and uh, I'm here because I think I can give a user perspective. Uh, I make charts, and every time I go down to make a specific chart, there are competing technologies, and it's it's a steep learning curve. And I've been trying to wrap my mind around how to think about it. And the idea of middleware comes to mind. If there's any way to be able to package things like middleware, sort of like what we do with the web stack where you can pick and choose the, and pieces fit like Lego. So I'm here mostly to hear what people say and perhaps give user feedback as a, someone who's a user, not a developer. Uh, the next person, um, let me look at. Adrian, how about you? Hi, I'm Adrian. Um, I have a UI library called Membrane, and I've been using that to make visualizations. And um, so I'm hoping that we can talk about ways that I can create visualizations and make them available to kind of all the different um, tools that package uh, these together. Uh, I've used mostly Reveal, but I think uh, there's a lot of really cool options that are popping up. and. Uh, and excited to see where they go. Um, I guess Vlad. Hi, uh, I'm Andrew Real. <laughs> uh, what else can I say? I'm probably the closest person geographically to Peter Strombeck uh, because 
uh, both he and I live in Sweden. Um, uh, regarding the problem of composability, I just want to like, share a, a small thought. Uh, it, it reminds me of like this, uh, like the problem is we have a lot of visual tools and they usually uh, have to coexist with the IDEs. And uh, there is also uh, like a lot of IDEs uh, and like this feels like M uh, by N problem uh, that a language server protocol solved for uh, programming languages uh, and IDEs. So maybe uh, that might, I don't know, inspire someone to think of something after <laughs> of something after that. Uh, and I'll pass the torch to Chris. Um, hey everyone, uh, my name is Chris. I work on uh, Portal, a data visualization tool. Um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm really interested in like how um, we can share whether it's like a, a platform level thing or the visual components. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure exactly what we can share, but um, it'd be really cool if if um, if things were more interoperable. Um, and e I guess even if we can't do the code level, I wonder if we could share UX so that it would at least feel more familiar to users so they could jump around. So I don't know, but yeah, um, that's me. Uh, I think, wait, uh, am I last? No, I yeah, I think I might be last. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Wait, did um, you do uh, Did you not go? No, I think everyone went, right, Kira? I think that's everyone. Yeah, so I had to step aside there for a second, but uh, I think that's all. Um, yeah, so maybe, sorry, I have some dogs here so I'm running in and out with this puppy <laughs> um yeah but I guess maybe it makes sense next Lucas if you want to go ahead with what you were saying there start start mm -hmm. the conversation about just issues you're having or integrating or or whatever just yeah the goal of the whole this whole thing hopefully will be to come out with some mm -hmm. ideas of how everyone can work better together so it makes sense to understand what kind of problems everyone's having yeah sure um, like me and um, Adrian have been talking on Zulip and the visual tools compatibility stream topic. I don't know what they're called on Zulip. Everybody has to call it yeah, differently. Um, try to find and, and share. Yeah, and um, we've been going back and forth a bit uh, about what we should call this if it's compatibility integration or whatever but i think in the end the name doesn't really matter that much the important part is okay where can we actually work together and he actually has four pretty decent points uh where like the first thing that we could do is try to make the visualizations themselves like the code for it uh, to be able to be used from different tools like um, Portal has multiple views that are pretty nice, like the, the, the I don't know, the, the, the bigger view now has integration with um, where you can send data back and forth, or the diff tool is very nice, which I haven't seen anywhere else where you can say, well, these two maps have these new things in common and green and red and whatever. Uh, it's really nice. And like, there are a lot of views and like, I don't know, Clark has like a few different views and reveal has a, has a lot of stuff in there. Um, that's very, very incompatible because it's uh, closure and uh, built on top of closure FX. But I think we could maybe come up with like some data language thing where we could at least like calling them the, the share it, even if we can't share the code beneath it. And for all the tools that are actually running inside the, the, the browser, we could probably also share some of the code for it. Uh, reveal will then probably be a little bit left on the wayside, but we can uh, share other things with like the closure tooling, probably, who knows. Uh, but that was one of the points. The other one was that, um, 
keyboard shortcuts and interactions and so on. That was uh, the, similar to Chris's point where it's like, even if we can't share a code, we might be able to have very similar UX designs uh, where the user knows, okay, if he hits the, I don't know, the G button then something gets grabbed or whatever, or in, review, uh, in portal, when you hit the E button, something expands and so on. Uh, we could come up with similar key bindings. So then if I switch from portal to reveal or to, uh, I don't know, to rebel, I haven't used rebel yet, but uh, I hear it does stuff. <laughs> um, you could hit the similar buttons and so on. Although I think it would make sense to be able to also configure them, just have similar defaults maybe. Um, yeah, then uh, the next point was like just reusable components beneath it. I think we had a talk about it the last time after the um, recording was stopped um, about a lot of the tooling having like infrastructure that could be pulled out of the tooling where um, Portal uh, is doing a lot of WebSocket RPC stuff um, that doesn't exist as library. And when I wanted to use it, I would have to basically take more than half of Portal with me. Um, and I'm guessing Reveal is gonna have similar stuff to send data back and forth. Although I think it might be in process so it doesn't have to. Um, but like, I think a lot of the tools links have infrastructure that could be shared uh, that doesn't need to be written. Um, and the uh, final point of Adrian was um, trying to standardize on installation steps. Um, I think that's easy and complicated at once, where it's like, okay, we could all say, well, we just use two steps and put it in and you're done. Um, but then you also need to be able to configure the stuff somehow. So you need a config Eden or whatever. Or what, and, um, and that was one of the things that I built, that, that at least I'm trying to build into um, Calva, uh, where different tools can configure other tools. Uh, where you basically inside your jar that's pulled down uh, by the depths Eden um, are configurations for tools that you can interact with. So uh, my Omnitrace library has now uh, a few configurations that get set inside Calva. And I could do the same, and Portal could be doing the same stuff where it's like, oh yeah, okay, now you've got this snippet that gets called, um, that the user can just call and he doesn't need to know how to start Portal or something, uh, or how to tap stuff into it or whatever. Um, and I saw, I don't remember his name. Um, Peter, I think I sent you the link, right? Um, of somebody building a Mali tool that uh, inspects incoming calls, builds a Mali specification for you. And then there's a little studio plugin that shows that inside of um, the tooltips. We, since like, I don't know, a few hours ago, uh, we can now do this thing in Calva where you can set, your tool can set tooltips inside Calva. Um, and I'm guessing there's a lot of other configuration things that we could pull out of other tools or set for other tools so that the user of our tools doesn't have to copy paste around like configs that they don't change anyway. Um, yeah, I think there's uh, like the four major points that we were talking about. Um, we can probably come up with more, but like I think they're pretty decently exhaustive. Yeah, I mean, just to summarize, I think we were talking about how to how we can reuse stuff so we can, because um, I think a lot of effort is being spent re-implementing thing and the four main categories that I listed, which I we can add to. Them into the chat. Uh, yeah, I think there was there were shorter them. versions, which were visualizations, UX, the evaluation model, because each of these tools needs to kind of interact and evaluate your code and then just common steps for configuration and installation. So those are the four main categories that I listed. Yeah, so okay. just a little step uh, for evaluation. Most of the stuff in Chlorine and Clover, my plugins for Atom and VS Code, they are completely separated from the, from the UI stuff, from the editor from internal APIs. So they live in a different library. It's a closure script library. We can reuse it if you want. 
So this is like, maybe it should be better to separate into a smaller libs because the current one is just a huge thing. Well, Shadow CLGS will like remove things that we are not using, so it's not a problem. But anyway, I don't think we want to, you know, get everything. <laughs> Yeah, it's still harder to share if it's just like spread around a bajillion namespaces and you don't know which one to call uh, if you yeah. want a specific thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Especially with Clojure Script, we've had the talk multiple times now where it's like, okay, it's hard to pull in the Clojure Script source uh, because then you have to build it and you have to know which NPM packages also to pull uh, if it depends on something and so on. So in Clojure Script kind of makes sense to have different uh, the different boundaries uh, than if you were in Clojure where you can just say, well, I'll just pull in the Clojure code and be done with it. Yeah, exactly. Also, because it, it expects you to implement some things of visualizations also, it will pull React. So I'm, I'm not sure if anyone wanting to evaluate code will want to pull React. It doesn't seem like a good idea. So other than the kind of four major areas, are there any other others that we're missing that we should also think about as kind of reusable um, that, yeah, that we could reuse across tools? I think, I think it is kind of related to your four points, but I think the way uh, I would love to state it is just being able to write things on the user side that would work with all tools. And of course that is stated in a kind of provocative, too ambitious way, but I think that matters. And if there is time, I would love to share something for a few minutes to kind of make it concrete, what we could hope for. Is it, is it good if I share the screen for a moment? Yes. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I'll share. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so here is Calva. Peter, thank you so much for Calva. Can you see Calva now? No, maybe not. Maybe it will appear in a moment, I guess. Right. So here's Calva. And what we have here is a little project that I'll share later uh, with Portal. And, you know, Portal can be embedded inside Calva. And so I just connected it to uh, the NREPL protocol so that we can, we don't need to explicitly tap things into portal, but every time we evaluate something, it would be sent to portal. And so we can send this value three and it, we can send this vector and it is rendered as hiccup and we can send this and it is rendered as code. And it is just this ad hoc decisions decision that I took here to kind of use this portal notation to express that I was, that I want this thing to be rendered this way, right? And what we hope to do is we hope to gradually create a collection of tutorials where everybody could create a tiny or big code examples and share with others so that it would work with all tools. So, what I think we could hope for is that we will have some notation like this, but that would be, that would work across tools, right? And maybe just to get a little a different flavor of this, then I'll share the browser for a moment and show what we tried to do at this node space tool. So I think you, uh, in a moment, Probably now you see the browser. So in node space, we uh, had three ways to express that this thing needs to, to be rendered this way. One was adding metadata to the code. So the code is uh, this expression of code we are evaluating. It gets this additional metadata that marks it to be rendered some way. Another way was adding metadata to the value. So we compute some value and then we attach some metadata to it by some function saying this thing is of this kind. 
And another way was through protocols. So uh, we have this protocol we are implementing that says this thing was, is of this kind. And we decide that a certain type of thing would implement this protocol. So we had different ways and we actually needed all of them to handle different situations on the user side where we just wanted things to, you know, just work so that something would be rendered as the user meant it to, to be. And the hope is that we could have something like that, that just works and that we could maybe, maybe decide together that it is flexible enough for different tools to express what they want. That, does it make sense? Daniel, that is exactly what I was thinking about. So if we go back to the web example that I mentioned, um, all that metadata does is a collection of functions that have a flow that attach ideas or parameters or formats as data moves up and then maybe with interceptors up and down and up the stack, right? So the idea would be that as a user, think of a data frame, I package my data in a data frame, I use those functions, to put my data in a specific format, then I pass that to a, um, a formatting or a data creation, uh, um, I'm sorry, an image creation uh, function, and then I pass that image creation function to the appropriate renderer. So I might take my data and then I package it and then create a Vega spec and then um, use a Vega light library to show it, or I might instead create a JPEG and then use whatever little thing to put it up on the page. Um, it should also work over the wire so that I could process things remotely and then bring it back to my laptop. Um, a little bit like some of the ideas that people have used for Jupyter, right? So that's, I think what, what you have, I think is bang on at the user level, but I think we, we could move it up one step down the food chain where the tool makers would also have those facilities. Um, it's a big idea, I think it's hard. Can you expand on this interceptor and going up and down? I, I sorry, I just didn't understand it. So think about you know when like you're creating maybe give an example. Yeah, so also, think about when you're handling when you when you're handling um, a web request. You know, so you you get it and then you look at the headers and then you need to add something. Maybe there's a routing component that needs to go and it just you add functions as you process down you you processing your response. So the response that you have is the application of functions. So your request need, need to, needs to be authorized, then you have an authorization function. Your request needs to do something with a route, then you route it. So that's sort of the idea. You know, it's, it's, it's abstractly, it's pretty simple. You have a request and the, the function returns an object that is augmented. And there are two paths, the next, thing to be done or a failure path. So, so I see this as like Lego blocks. But how, that make is this, sense? how is this related to visual tools? Right now so, for me, it just looks like a, a regular code. Like, yeah, you call a function that does a web request and then you uh, I don't know, catch an error it, or it, process you, the result. You're absolutely right. It's just a function, but but the idea is that there is a protocol for, there's a, an agreement on a, a way to process these things. So it's not ad hoc. Does that make sense? So, you know, so like when you think about, people complain about Clojure not having a web stack. We don't have a web framework, uh, Packet Luminous. We have pieces that we plug together. That's what's super rich about the web ecosystem in Clojure. So what I'm thinking about is something similar for, for visualizations. There should be, ideally, there should be no separation between data processing and visualization creation. And the only difference it, when you would do the, whatever different aspects of, 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 of processing it, visually, it's the renderer. So if you've looked at the Glamour's toolkit, you have data 
that can be shown in different ways. I think that's really what, what I would love to have as a user. Is anyone familiar with how small talk approaches this problem? I'm not, that why, that's why I'm asking. I just know it does. And that's, I think, I think the Glamorous Toolkit people have a really interesting and strong point of view on that. I'm not an expert, I've just seen a couple of videos, but I think that's something that maybe we should as a group look at. Um, I know that um, I watched, there's some long sessions that are really interesting that Gene Kim and Eric Norman did, where they kind of, um, yeah, I think there's a set of three videos I can put in the chat, but it's interesting because they bring the closure perspective and then they work with the, I think it's the creator of Glamour's Toolkit, and um, which is kind of a small talk environment, which has a lot of these um, features that we're interested in. And they work through it. And then they also, uh, while getting feedback about how they're using it. Um, so it's it's really interesting. I think one of the things that's that I noticed is that for them, they did um, the like both the coding environment, the um, program that you're working on, all the visualizations, those are all in process and they're all connected. Um, it is similar to Clojure in the sense that like um, the your program is all running through the REPL as well as your kind of dev tools. The only difference is that for a lot of closure environments, the um, the programming environment, the IDE, isn't necessarily running in the same process as the as your program and your dev tools. So that is a uh, one thing that I noticed. Yeah, and maybe maybe it would be good to maybe come back to the problem statement and see if of the different part of the problem you stated, we would like to focus on one or two and see if we could come up with something. But does it make sense? Yeah, I would find it like, um, to me, as a user, uh, the reveal and portal are pretty similar, right? Uh, I mean, underneath the very different really built and so on, but in the end, they're more or less like, the idea is to replace the REPL output and they do the showing of stuff uh, of the print uh, in REPL. Um, and it would be interesting to be able to like write uh, viewers and so on uh, the ones and be able to use them on both. And I realized that's pretty difficult because they use very different visualization models. Um, but I think it would make sense to try to come together on some way where we can do the same thing there, uh, because I think it's way easier than um, if we can get to some point where they can interact, um, we can pretty easily take note space and clerk and whatever, uh, because, because they are basically already doing the same thing. Um, we just need to come up with like the correct names inside the hash maps that they, uh, they use as vector uh, as views um, and then they'll be pretty easily compatible. Uh, I think the harder part is going to be um, with something like reveal and uh, Adrian's tool. I always forget the name, uh, but since it's SWT as well, I think uh, that it's harder to, or at least it's Java as well. So it's harder to, to integrate uh, with all mm -hmm. the HTTP, uh, HTML blah, stuff, <laughs> uh, all the other ones use. I, I will say, uh, so all the visualizations that I've made so far are using my own uh, UI library called Membrane, which mm -hmm. I'm not trying to get everybody to use, but the they all run, um, they're renders for um, Canvas 2D and the browser, HTML, uh, JavaFX, Swing, um, and there's also an iOS implementation. So you can, these visualizations can run in all these different environments. And the key is it, the key is really just uh, building your visualizations out of primitives like shapes, text, and images. Um, so if you do that, all these different environments can render those and you get a lot of reusability for free. Um, so I think 
if we were trying to make visualizations more reasonable, instead of using uh, kind of platform specific uh, visualizations like um, Java effects or divs and spans, if you kind of just specify your UI in shapes, text, and images, then it's pretty trivial to kind of convert them into either HTML, draw to canvas, Java effects. Um, so that is, if, if making these things reusable is one of the goals, that is a good way to do it. And there are, um, there are other projects that kind of do a similar thing, um, like, uh, yeah, so. So I just um, had a, a wild idea. Uh, uh, is to annotate uh, like the visit option uh, objects that can be visualized differently, like with metadata that's pointing to a dependency, and then use yes. uh, uh, something like add lib branch from tools devs to like, just load this dependency and make it displays the visualization. And I think this is something that. If the visualization, if the visualization is uh, um, like knows that it will show on a HTML page, uh, then I think this is something that I guess both me and Chris can do. Yeah, I built some uh, reveal plugins, and the API is really great as a visualization creator because. Um, one, as uh, Vlad was saying, you can use tool depth, so you can um, actually load it at runtime and just say like, oh, I like this visualization. I didn't load it because I didn't put it on my class path, but even while my REPL is already running, I can just add that dependency. And then um, I think it's uh, there's just some protocols that you implement. So if you implement the correct protocol, then at runtime, all of a sudden this new visualization is added uh, and is available in reveal. Um, if I'm not, I think uh, I haven't used any of the ones that run in the browser yet. I don't know. It sounds like that's a more difficult problem just because look, there's no tools depths where you can, or maybe there is. I don't know if there's a tools depths that lets you just dynamically load a library and then implement some protocols and then have it part of your um, dev environment. I think for the closure script stuff is the code loading is always a little bit harder. Because mm. uh, you, you always need like a, a, a parent or a host or something, if, especially if you're in the browser. Yeah, yeah I think what, sorry, sorry, continue. Oh, I was gonna say, so I feel like what we're talking about is like a, a UX problem kind of like what are the APIs that users can rely on, depend on whether it's the shape of data, the annotation of data via keywords or, you know, um, metadata. Um, it feels like our, that we're like discussing the UX in, in some ways, but uh, I just wanted to put, point that out. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, like the UX is the easier part maybe because then we can say, well, it's just a, closure map with like these keys and like the first key is like, I don't know the name of the viewer and so on. Um, and maybe there's like a tiny SCI function in there somewhere that can also do stuff, whatever. And I think that could be used basically by any tool uh, that's in closure anyway, uh, because everybody can run SCI code like somehow probably. Uh, the harder part would be to like use the whole underneath stuff like it would be interesting. I haven't looked deeply into membrane yet or like basically not more than the, the two minutes of uh, looking at the GitHub, but like if like the tool could really be like, okay, and anybody can write a membrane view and instead of writing the portal views in like the React reagent, whatever way we have right now, we would write them in membrane and the same thing for reveal and so on. And then it could spit out then the React part or the closure FX part or whatever. Uh, then we it would be way easier for all of us to just take one, like build the same membrane library where like, there's a bajillion viewers uh, and people can just use what they like. Um, but 
I don't know if it can actually like replace the whole richness that we get with reagent and react and whatever in the browser. Yeah, I would say like um, as the as an implementer, the main thing I feel like I get out of something like CSS is layout. That's probably the big thing. So like specify things in terms of shapes, I think um, works until I need to start organizing things. And I don't want to have to organize things. I just want to look to like, I want to, um, you know, some algorithm to organize things for me. Oh, that's like eliminate another problem uh, in terms of uh, uh, visual tools composability. It's, uh, it's pretty, uh, Convenient to use when it is uh, separated from the ID. Uh, like initially, I tried with a separate window, and now with the like uh, sticker windows that are on top of it, uh, on top of the ID, and it, it's uh, yeah, it creates friction. It's uh, uh, I think very unfortunate uh, that this exists. And I, I would prefer to be able to create a tool that runs in in ID, but I don't want to write a plugin for every ID out there. And I'm not sure what can be a common ground like for visualizations available from the IDs because I, I'm not sure this this can be HTML canvas or like HTML page because like enclosure uh, I think it's a uh, around half or maybe maybe. 30, 40% uh, use Emacs. And uh, I, I'm not sure, can, can, can it even render HTML uh, with some JavaScript running inside Emacs? I think there's like a version of WebKit that you can embed somehow. You have to compile some stuff, but mm. yeah, it's not great. Yeah, I think the I don't actually know if you really want to run in the inside the IDE because like with Calva, one of the problems uh, that, that I was facing when extending it is like, okay, but it's a different process than like the REPL. Yeah, sure, you can talk with the REPL, but there's always something lost in translation because you're just like, you're not inside the actual REPL. My code can, that I just pull in uh, and like, if I pull reveal in or portal or whatever, it's running in the same process as my code and it can do a lot more stuff than Calva can do because Calva will then have, uh, have to run to the REPL and tell it, well, please do this. And then you get some information back. But if the information is like some lazy forever sequence, you're now exploding and now you need to handle that and so on. And if you're in the same process, it's way easier. Um, but I also very much understand that it makes sense to be able to like be more integrated into the IDE, where it's not the, 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 like for reveal and portal, uh, especially it's like, well, I don't want to have to type in tap something. That's super annoying. It's way easier if I just hover over some line, hit a hotkey and that gets tapped over automatically. Um, like as if I was like the IDE itself. Um, but I think that comes back to the word, uh, to the uh, configuration integration. I was talking about initially. Um, and for at least for Calva, it's not possible that you can, your tool can set hotkeys uh, inside Calva and run arbitrary code uh, inside the actual REPL that you then uh, do so that your user can basically hit a hotkey, it gets spit into REPL or reveal or whatever. Um, and they feel as if your tool was actually like the IDE. You know, it's still in a different window, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, do we actually kind of want it into, in a different window, especially on Emacs, where there's like no, uh, like really deep uh, the display of stuff, I think. Yeah, uh, interesting because in Clover, I was able to do this, like you hit a hotkey and you rewrite your query in a way that you can tap and then render the result. But I agree, it's like it's it's not straightforward like if you have to tap everything manually because you will probably forget. And I also have the same problem that 
Lucas is, is telling, like, um, I do have a lost in translation step when I have to serialize and deserialize things. The problematic part for my part, at least, is I also support non-traditional closure environments, for example, closure Lang and Lumo and Plank. And these do not have any visual tool written from them. So I kind of want to have the visualizations working in these environments, but well, I can't inject a closure code in them because they are not closure per se. They are like Erlang with a closure thing inside it. It's hard. <laughs> Yeah, wouldn't it be nice if the thing that is gets serialized and sent to a different process is just the UI specification and not the not the uh, like data you have with all its uh, complexity, like infinite sequences or I don't know atoms with self references. I just excuse me. I just. Threw up. I've been. I started drawing a diagramming Inkscape, just trying to keep track of all the different concerns that we're discussing. And I threw that up, and if people like it, I can keep it up. If people would rather see each other's faces more, then I can take it back down. Or if we want to do something, a mixture of that, I'm cool. But uh, just this is my way of contributing right now. Uh, thoughts. Shall I keep this up or shall I take it back away? Um, I think one thing that is also in here somewhere that or that may be uh, good to add is just um, all of these. I mean, I think like clerk and reveal and portal have some sort of evaluation model where you like, I mean, usually it's the REPL, but they kind of do some extra. And uh, I know specifically, I know that clerk will do things like um, since you're sending the visualizations over the wire, if you have data in process that's very large, it'll actually just send parts of it. Um, and I think it also does dependency management. And as you're typing and editing your code, it will um, track the dependencies within your namespace and only reevaluate parts of it. So that basically it keeps everything in sync, and but it doesn't have to. It's kind of like as if it was reevaluating everything and giving you that result, but without actually spending the time uh, every keystroke to reevaluate everything. Um, and I think some of that evaluation model is uh, might be a reusable piece that um, that can go in the picture that's uh, reusable across tools. Right. Yeah, the like one experience I have with um, what is it called, uh, pagination? I guess like shipping less data than the user has is that you don't ever get the the number right. So that's all. I I, I used to do that within a portal and be like, you only get like ten thousand or something. But someone was like, I have eleven thousand, and I'm like, okay, well it's two fifteen. And you know, it's just I, I never know what that limit is, um, especially because the hard part about the data serialization is that it depends on how you're trying to view it later on which comes later like you can't know that before you serialize how because like if you're doing a plot and you just have like ten thousand points you want to ship that over but if you have like a, a vector of ten thousand maps then it's like maybe you only care about one of them individually as opposed to all of them together and like aggregate so but yeah that's just a challenge i experienced but i do think that vlad is um brings up an interesting point which is like instead of shipping the data, what if we ship like a specification for the UI that is data? Because that's a, that's a much smaller subset. Instead of like trying to support all data, we support a subset of the data, which is like, here's a visual language, whether that's something like Hiccup or I'm not, I'm not sure what that would be, but. That makes, that was kind of what I was driving at with, okay, where is that again? I took it down because didn't want to like dominate everything. Um, with calling these a binding layer. I mean, we saw kind and its way of doing that earlier. 
um, where there was both metadata at runtime, there was a protocol, and I forget what the third one was. Did I remember the name right? Uh, I think it was Daniel you showed this. Kind. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, yeah, somebody else showed something that was like Hiccup. And um, I think if we're going IPC, we need something kind of like Hiccup or data, some data way of describing this or abstract way of doing this, or maybe the abstraction. We got the abstraction and then the ways of attaching it, which is like the concern kind addresses. Hey, no pun intended here. <laughs> and so the, the the struggles I've had with um, trying to think about these like I guess UI models is that interactivity and in state always ends up having to be in the picture, and that's harder to do when it's remote. So it's like, uh, like where, where does the state live? Does it live, like do you ship a description of the UI and then like the client takes over from there and the state lives there. Uh, but then as like things change in the UI, like I, I don't know what that full pipeline looks like of back and forth. Uh, Vlad, uh, in review, the, the whole process is in the same process, right? There's no extra thing that you need to ship around or something you're completely in the same process, right? Well, you have different threads that need to talk to each other, but otherwise you're, it's the easy route, right? Yeah, uh, but you also, like, Reveal can wrap peer apples and visualize uh, like results from other processes, uh, just using the peer apple protocol. And Chris, yours is uh, mostly based on transit, I think. It's just a manual implement, well, manual, but uh, it's just a re-implementation of transit, right? Yeah, it, 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 it is like transit. I had issues with um, fixing a version on the class path, and I couldn't can't do that. So, uh, But it, it also does other things like um, holding on to runtime objects so you can inspect them later on. So there's, it's like doing a bunch of things in memory to hold on to references which is like dangerous. <laughs> if you do that too much, then you don't have any more memory. I, I don't know that at all from Omnipress where I remember every function call ever. <laughs> Never getting too big. <laughs> um, by the way, we have uh, half an hour till the official time. And maybe, maybe we could think of concrete steps in a moment. Kira, what do you think? Is it a good time to kind of transition to thinking of how we should continue? Like, for example, Lukas suggested a concrete thing we could try, which is writing something that works in both reveal and portal. So maybe we could phrase a, a toy project. We could try together, or two or three of us could try as a proof of concept of what we are trying to achieve. That, does it make sense to, to think about that? I would love to do that. Like if I know that Porto it's closure script, right? Well, the, it's half closure script and half closure, right? I mean, there's a big part that runs in your REPL environment and then it communicates via uh, the transit to the part that lives inside the browser window and that communicates back and forth. Oh, so the the visualizations would be closure script. Is that what I meant? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so there and React reagent mix hybrid thing. But there's oh, also an SCI layer. You can and uh, from your REPL, you can uh, call uh, what is it called eval SCI thing or whatever, and yeah. then it gets uh, evolved inside the closure script. Part, so you don't need to um, recompile some closure script and send it to the browser because that always um, is interesting. Okay, no, because if some if we could work around something that works in Porto, I could adapt to using Chlorine and Clover probably, because I also am closure script, SCI, everything that you use already it's already there. Yeah, that's the reason I said when we should try to get like a reveal and portal to work together because portal and all the other stuff is already in a browser. Like 
getting it to run then in chlorine or getting it to run in, chlor in chloric or os or whatever uh, we've got a few more of those right um, it's probably not be as hard uh, so if we can come up with some description some protocol some whatever uh, that works both in uh, the reveal and portal um, getting it to run in all the other tools is like the easiest step afterwards probably yeah. one of the things i've been able to do is like embed the portal ui inside of reveal uh because uh, vlad tried it and he said it didn't work so i fixed it and i did get it to work so i think there is some embedding we can do um but i guess my question would be like what would be the goal so um, yeah sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, from my side, it, I think it would be interesting to then be able to share uh, viewer implementations uh, because currently I'm like, okay, yeah, no, I really like the diff view in portal, but I want to see it inside uh, like a sticker uh, or I want to use it in a clerk notebook or um, there's some cool thing that clerk does with um, like, I don't know how to describe it, but whatever, it's just a view. Um, and if I could use that in uh, portal, that would be really nice. Uh, and so on, because like everybody has like a few views that are unique. Um, and if we all use the very similar language to build the views, uh, we could then use one in the other and it wouldn't be like, well, I need to now use all five at once and um, I need a new MacBook with more RAM. Um, so. so I think we're... I was just going to say that I, I already have um, some reveal plugins and um, the components in, should be able to also spit out HTML or draw to Canvas. So if there's somebody that I can work with to try to make those plugins also work in Portal or any of the other tools, I think I'd be happy to do that. And that may be a good step because it already works in reveal and um, I mean, that's kind of my dream is like, I make the visualization and then I just have implementations of the protocols that make all the different tools happy or potentially even one protocol that is shared across all of them. And then I can just create visualizations and then I can use whichever tool feels right. Um, and I can just make them available to whoever wants to use them. And it makes it easier for me to, to do that. I, I think for that use case, um... What I would expect, right, I'm assuming that they'd be written in like for the JVM closure, those visualizations. So the user would come with a JVM REPL, they would load up the library for visualizations, um, they would generate the output, um, whether it's like a PNG or an image buffer uh, or, or HTML, and then they would send it to someplace. I, I see that um, um, for like one shot visualizations. And I'm not sure if that's what we're talking about, if we're talking about like interactive visualizations. Yeah, for Clarine, I would have to go to interactive visualizations. For example, in my case, for example, in, the, in my example of the chessboard, I could interact with the chessboard. Like I could see the steps, I could click on each uh, piece and get the data structure that I would copy and paste to the to my my code. I think I will probably do a talk only about this chessboard because it's been amazing to work with. <laughs> yeah, I think, but we've got like the back and forth in, well, not all the tools, but like most of the tools and, um, in Revealed, you can also like, I don't know if it's been there always, but uh, the, you posted it, I don't know, maybe a month ago or something where you can click on something in Reveal and it posts back into, the, the, into your actual running code. Uh, portal can do, do the same thing uh, that's always been able to do it like in the commands thing and now you can like also like manipulate some atoms or whatever so the communication there are more multiple different ways to communicate back and forth uh, and in chlorine like you said you can always also do it because like it's built on the interaction side of things and just sending i mean just generating some jpeg and showing it in some tool is not Super interesting, I think. Uh, like, like you said, Chris, uh, the, the interesting part is to be able to have some language where we can say, well, this is, but when you click this, also call this in some other code, uh, please. And this 
specification should then be able to run in multiple tools. Yeah, but is this is this something we're like talking about for users or for like plugin authors or? I think it would make sense first for plugin authors and then for users, because us plugin authors are usually like take more complicated stuff and are okay with at first. Uh, and once we find the kinks and so on, we can make it one level higher. So it's actually usable by people who don't want to dig into the source. I think, I mean, I don't want to man. Mm -hmm. Manipulate whatever, <laughs> like the whole space. So maybe somebody else has a different opinion. Yeah, uh, I agree in parts. Like it should be great for the for have visualization tools to, for plugin authors first, because it could like show the building blocks for users. But I would like to also get the power to the end user. Currently in Clarin and only in Clarin because of the implementations of VS Code API, any user can like get any anything that runs in Node.js, for example, I don't know, Vega Lite, Vega, Highline, High Charts, anything, and just plug in inside the Clarin. So you can render a high charts or a Vega Lite inside the Clarin without too much work. And it's like user space, not plugin space, but not on VS Code. And that's one of the sad things about uh, Atom dying because <laughs> I want to support that also on VS Code side too. Yeah, so uh, maybe here is a suggestion what we maybe, what we could maybe try is to define maybe kind of uh, uh, what proof of concept we wish to try, and then maybe try to use this time to make it accurate so that it would be useful for the variety of, of, of situations here. So I think we have two, two, you, two test cases in mind. One, if I understand correctly, is being able to write a component and use it, render it in different tools. Right, where a component is maybe a reagent component, but not necessarily because for some tools it might need to be something else. So that is one thing, just being able to write UI code that is shareable between tools. And another proof of concept is being able to write some user code that renders in a few tools, maybe a namespace that you would like to just be able to see in reveal portal, node space, clerk, or whatever. Right? Is it a good way to look into it? And then I guess we could just write oh. it by that demonstrates what we have in mind, just to make it very concrete. Yeah, you you mentioned like a namespace, something that we can import inside, I don't know, the, the repo and something like this. Yeah, for my part, it, this could not work. Like I, as I said, I do support, for example, Clojure that's on our Erlang side. And there, it's something that I would like to not depend on external toolings. So, but well, we can start from there and then get start to iterate over this. I don't know. Could you explain that? You, you mean that you wouldn't like to depend on having a namespace? No, for example, um, on chlorine, when you evaluate something, it's completely separated from the when you render something, it's completely separated from the closure repo or the closure skip repo. It's just something that's running on the plugin side, if I could say like that. So for example, if I evaluate something in the example of the chessboard, for example, the chessboard was a hiccup data structure. And I was just like evaluating something, returning a vector that represents the, the hiccup data structure. And then I was rendering this structure and that's all. So there's no like specific namespace, nothing that's like specific from the, from the visualization that I want. So if I had to, I don't know, import a library inside the closure repo or in, in repo or whatever I'm using to support that, 
this would break some assumptions that I have in my system. Like it doesn't matter what you're running. This is something that uh, Clarine do. It simply says, okay, are you running in a socket repo? Yes, okay, so I support your use case. And this is something like complicated for multiple of things. First, that all closure implementations have different uh, small but annoying chain things that are diff different and do not support well. For example, in Clojure, Clojure Lang, I did have to do some hacking because some of the elements don't, don't support what I uh, expect. So yeah, uh, importing a namespace for visualization would break, for example, the visualizations for Clojure or Clojure in our, on Erlang or for Lumo, for example. And yeah, it will not work on my set. I think it wouldn't make much of a difference for the rest of us to not say, well, we don't want to be able to render namespace. We want to render like a map that has stuff in it. Uh, I mean, rendering a namespace is basically the same thing. Here are a few devs uh, that, um, that have some stuff. Uh, whatever is in those devs uh, or devs or whatever. Uh, but in the end, it's just some bars. If instead of saying, well, here's a few bars, we say, well, here's one map with a few uh, names, well, a few keywords, and those keywords are basically the bars in the namespace. Well, it, it doesn't really like translating one to the other is like trivial, right? Yeah, but maybe one thing that could bit different across tools is whether we are rendering a value or the code, right? Whether we have the original code at this moment of decision of how to render, right? Because some tools may rely only on the evaluated value. Does it make sense, this distinction? Um, yes. And yeah. I think we should render values, not code. Uh, Mauricio, um, out of interest, can I, in the beginning, I said, well, everybody uh, can run SCI somehow. Uh, so that's something where we can send code around. Is that actually true? Can like Clojure, uh, Olang and so on, can they run SCI? Uh, no, exactly, but they can run on the plugin side. Like they can evaluate a code that translates to SCI code. And then I evaluate on the plugin side. And that's exactly how I'm doing right now. Mm. So for example, Claude, if, I, if I am connecting Clorine in a Clojure repo, the Clojure repo doesn't need to have a CI on the class path. Mm -hmm. It will use the, in fact, if it does have, it will be ignored. Like I'm using the, the plugin side only. <laughs> so uh, the, actually if we said, well, we need to ship code around because something needs to be interactive. So you actually need code. Uh, unless we want to write basically our own way of interpreting stuff and then we're actually writing our own programming language, which doesn't really make sense. Uh, then saying, well, we just do it with SCI and then everybody is happy, right? I think so. Even if the, even right now that Bark did said that SCI is faster, so I'll be even more happy. <laughs> And I mean, the other thing is that if somebody says, well, no, SCI sucks, I don't want it. And uh, like, I don't know, maybe Vlad will reveal because he's got access to actual closure. Well, then it's still running SCI, right? Because like closure can just run the SCI code uh, without having SCI. It's just going to say, well, that's just closure code. I don't care. And it's just going to run inside all the other stuff, right? I think. My brain is telling me yes, but I don't know if I, maybe I'm missing something, but I think it's fine. Uh, CIH should be the subset of closure that everybody can run. So it means that we need some standard way to uh, define the settings of running a CI code, which means what we are binding, what, what symbols are bound to what values so that it evaluates, right? Yeah, maybe uh, a bunch of namespace, the four namespaces that we we will support should be great. I'm sort of not sold on the whole idea of SCI, but I don't have any 
uh, alternatives that I can suggest. Yeah, plus, you don't really need it, right? You can just eval closure code. That's like the problem in the browser where we're like, well, we want to eval some user code that he gave us. And then it's like, yeah, but we can't uh, because we can't eval the closure script or in the browser. Well, we could in the browser with like importing the whole uh, the self hosted closure script, but uh, that's a whole different set of problems. And you can just say, well, it's closure code. I'll just eval it in the JVM. No, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm not sure maybe this is the, the best idea for uh, this common visualization protocol thingy at all. But uh, could it be just uh, some, I don't know, declarative uh, specification of uh, I don't know how to render stuff. <laughs> yeah, the the idea I think is to have a declarative way of how to render stuff. But if you want interactivity, you can use like code to have it. Maybe some tools would not support interactive at all. I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, SCI is just a runtime, right? And if we could, you know, if we are agreed that we'll support the subset of closure that runs in SCI, that doesn't, I don't think that precludes us from also running in it in, say, self hosted closure script or inside of closure proper, right? Or am I missing something? No, you're right. Uh, the, we could also just run it in something that actually has more capabilities. I mean, there's not that much that's missing from SCI these days, but uh, you can also just run it in self hosted the closure script and uh, the user wouldn't notice the difference. Um, and I think like what Vlad is saying makes sense. We should be as descriptive as possible and have as little code going over the wire as possible. Uh, but well, at some point you need to have to be able to say, well, I want to run an addition or something. And yeah, sure, we could basically say, well, then tell me you need ink or whatever. But in the end, then we're just defining a new language, right? Um, at some point when you want interactivity, you need to run some kind of code. Uh, and like, I don't think there's a way around it. Um, to that point, another source of, in, uh, possible source of inspiration is the Eclipse modeling tools. A lot of people know Eclipse as the IDE, but the modeling tools is like, uh, the uh, Eclipse modeling framework is like small talk reinvented inside of Java, where you just have everything is just data. And then on top of that, you have meta data, um, a meta model that can describe user interfaces in the abstract. And then on top of that, and there's, they've just done a tremendous amount of work in making Java work like small uh, work like small talk or Lisp. I meant to say Lisp, reinvented inside of Java, but with objects, so it's kind of small talky too. Um, by the way, we have nine minutes to the official time, and maybe uh, it would be good to try to conclude. And afterwards, a few of us might wish to stay after we stop the recording, but um, maybe. If anybody would like to kind of think of how you would like to conclude, and maybe uh, you could also write later your bottom lines uh, in the chat so that we can have some notes of this meeting, if it is okay. And uh, is it good? Uh, or Kira, do maybe do you have some other idea of how we could conclude this in a kind of conclusive way? Uh, no, sounds sounds good. That makes sense to me. Yeah, so maybe, for example, I'll suggest something. What I hope to suggest is that, uh, from my conclusion, is that uh, two or three of us will meet to write a proof of concept and then share with the group so that we have an idea of what we're trying to do. And then if anybody wishes to join those two or three, then please tell me and we'll set a small meeting and write something. So 
And maybe you others would also like to kind of offer some idea of how we proceed. Yeah, so for me, if, um, so I have made a reveal plugin, if there's other tools that uh, can point to either, even internal APIs for creating visualizations or um, I'm basically, I'm happy to guinea pig um, any kind of way to make a visualization available to other tools. And um, yeah, and I'm happy to do it for any of the environments that are available, whether it be web or um, on the JVM, et cetera. I liked the idea uh, we had earlier about uh, <clears throat> you doing portal and reveal first um, as a, a good starting point to start shaking out some of the concerns. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to work on that. Uh, getting a, a membrane visualization working in, inside of Portal. I find the data interesting and I'm willing to think more about it. Maybe not starting writing some proof of concepts, but at least I'll. I think about it. Yeah, great. So, so I guess um, uh, I'll write in the stream uh, so that we can try to set a small session of a few of us. And anybody who wishes to be part of this uh, joint coding, please write to me. And um, yeah. Uh, so if there aren't any other concluding remarks, then maybe Kira, we should stop the recording. What do you think? Or maybe there are, sorry for kind of jumping. Um, I think uh, the, I don't know if he's here, still here. Oh, Peter is still here, right? Uh, I think we should take the opportunity. And um, since multiple of us were saying, well, it would be nice if we could integrate deeper into the IDEs with our tools um, and take the opportunity to like, I don't know, hit him over the head with some ideas that we, or some features that we would like to see uh, in some, something like Calvar or like, we don't have uh, the Mr. Saida guy, right? Uh, no, we don't, um, but uh, at least we've got 50% of the, <laughs> no, I think there's still Neobim or something, but um, maybe, I don't know if Chris or Vlad or uh, whoever is like building the actual tools, I'm just a user basically. If you guys have something that you would like and maybe like shake it out together or something. I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't want to. Uh, when I was working on the VS Code plugin, it would have been nice to have access to the REPL uh, to add like my own, like, or to just add my own VS Code commands and then interact with the Clojure REPL so that I don't have to do that wiring. But it sounds like that you solved that problem, Lucas, by just adding some config to your uh, jar. So I don't know if I, I don't know if that's really necessary anymore. So could you elaborate a bit on that? How how this config could like replace your need for the REPL uh, connection? Oh, um, so I was I was gonna add like a few commands to the command palette in VS Code. And then when the user interacts with that, I would invoke um, some API methods that I had and that would be available in the runtime with some configuration to do all the wiring for them. Um, but it sounds like, I, if I understand correctly, Lucas is saying that you can provide stuff in your jar that Calvo will pick up that will be commands that have yes, arbitrary exactly. code evaluated in the runtime, which is essentially mm -hmm. what I was looking for. So. Would there be like uh, the, would there be more that you would want to do with the REPL connection? Uh, because I've been also talking to Peter, where we're like, well, maybe we would want to expose like the, the just uh, in some way the socket that uh, NREPL exists on, and then you can just have your own NREPL client and uh, fire directly against it. I don't know if it's helpful, but uh, the, um, then we like sometimes it's probably be gonna be annoying to go through the Calva. <laughs> replace 
whatever stuff um, and I, I would rather it be like a function call like here's here's the code evaluate coming the result the reason being that and REPL is only one protocol. There's also socket, REPL, and all the other protocols. So if they could just be like, call a function and then, you know, do the eval stuff and then maybe you get a promise back. I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. John, yeah, no, that would work with the stuff I built uh, where you just have some closure code and you can put in like template bars that get replaced where you say, well, I want to have what the user is hovering over or whatever. Is it sort of like replay, uh, REPL commands in cursive? Like you can define a short snippets. Ah, so you can define a, sh a short snippets where you can so, uh, select where you like uh, insert at the time of navigation, like current current top level form uh, that is selected in the editor or current form or uh, name of the file. Mm -hmm. I think this thing is is very useful for me. Yeah, this has always been possible in Calva, um, but before you had to make your user copy paste some configuration with all those snippets into his mm -hmm. project settings. And now mm -hmm. you can just ship uh, those configurations inside your jar and the user will automatically have all the extra uh, the, like custom commands in his uh, the mm -hmm. command thing when he opens it. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize I was unmuted. That dog's so loud. <laughs> yeah, I think we're uh, actually done, oh, right? Sorry. So let's kind of go back to you, right? Yeah, sometime what we, we learned last time is that after the recording, we have wonderful conversations. So maybe it is good to kind of conclude if anybody uh, or Kira, maybe you'd like to kind of uh, say goodbye to the recording if we are done with this part. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I guess don't have much to say. Just, uh, yeah, apologies for these noisy dogs. And uh, thanks for for taking the time. And, and sounds like some exciting stuff coming up. So, uh, yeah, thanks everyone.